Good morning. Beautiful day in New York City. My mask matches my tie. Always a good way to start the day, even if it is coincidental. Uh, we have from my far right, Commissioner Tony Anucci, who is the Commissioner of uh, New York State Department of Corrections. Uh, Tony has uh, been with me from day one. He's done an extraordinary job. It's one of the hardest positions in state government, I think, uh, running the correction system. Uh, and Tony's done an outstanding job, so I want to thank him. It's a pleasure to be with him today. To my immediate right, Melissa DeRosa, Secretary to the Governor. To my immediate left, Gareth Rhodes, uh, Deputy Superintendent of Department of Financial Services, and uh, Kelly Cummings to Gareth's left. Uh, Kelly, as you know, is Director of State Operations, uh, and she has done a remarkable job. You know, this has been a stress test for governments all across the country. Uh, government had to perform. It was not about just talking, right? It was not about rhetoric and pontification. It was about performance. And that's what government is supposed to be able to do. We lost sight of that for a long time. We thought po government became a political exercise. And if you took the right political positions, then you did your government duty. No, no, no. Government has to work. It has to operate. It has to function. Uh, and we, we, we've seen under this COVID stress test what governments could actually perform and what governments couldn't perform. All those logistical things, setting up testing sites, coordinating labs, doing the contact tracing. Uh, it was hard. Government never had a challenge like that before. Not in my lifetime. Uh, and I'm very proud of the way the uh, employees of New York State government responded, and I'm proud of Kelly Cummings' leadership. Let's talk about today where we are. We're day 145, a bright sunny day, good news, all good news. 706 hospitalizations, lowest since March 18th. Number of deaths, 13. We don't like to lose anyone, obviously, and there are no thoughts and prayers, but that is also good news relative to where we were. Three-day average of lives lost is down to eight. That is good news. Number of tests yesterday, 69,000 tests, 811 positive. That's a 1.1% positive rate. That is also good news. You look across the regions of the state, you see all good news. Uh, you see a little tick in the capital region, it's the Albany capital region. We had uh, just about 30 positives from one July 4th party. One party, uh, 30 positives, 28 positives. You understand why we say one bad event, one bad group can be a real problem. One party, 30 people. Remember what we went through in New Rochelle. One super spreader, first hot spot in the United States. One person can make a difference. Uh, but all the numbers are good. You look across New York City, likewise, all the numbers are good. Uh, because it's good, we then say good news. Data is clear. We congratulate New Yorkers because they climbed the highest and hardest mountain, and uh, we are on the other side. The big caution, the but, is but, we don't want to climb any more mountains. It was not fun. It tested the character of the people of the state, tested the competence of the government, uh, and uh, New Yorkers did it. But we don't want to do it again. And we're wary of new threats that are on the horizon. And that is uh, the bad news, is the concerning trends that we're seeing around the country primarily. And it's important that we, we learn the lesson of what we have gone through. Uh, this is not that COVID descended on us yesterday. Uh, it's been six months. In New York, we were ambushed. Virus came from, New from Europe. Nobody knew, nobody told us. We woke up one morning and the spike was already happening. 
we were ambushed. That's not where we are today. It's been six months. We know what COVID is about. We've been talking about testing and tracing and quarantine. It's been six months. Uh, let's at least learn the lesson of the past six months. Let's learn the facts of the past six months. Uh, we're still having this same inane political discussion. Uh, well, you should reopen, reopen right away. Uh, no, no, that was never the question. And now we have six months of experience to know what happens when you do that, right? Uh, it wasn't about uh, do we reopen or not? The question was always, yes, you reopen. Of course you reopen. You reopen as quickly as you can. But you have to be smart in how you reopen. You have to follow the science and the metrics. You still have today uh, people who are operating politically uh, suggesting just reopen, just reopen. Even President Trump isn't saying that anymore. And he was the main booster of that theory, right? And we see what happens when you rush a reopening. We have the proof of six months of experiments. Some states reopened right away. Some states, New York, said no. Let's do a phased reopening. Let's study the metrics and let's do it intelligently and in the long run that will be better because if we just reopen immediately we run the risk of the virus going up and then we have to close that is exactly what has happened it's not a question of political theory he said she said conservatives say this this one said we have the results we went to the laboratory we tested it new york began reopening may 15th I said at that time, we expect the virus may go up once you start reopening. Why? Because the activity is going to increase. More activity, more spread. We started reopening. You know what happened? The number went down. It didn't go up. It went down. I was wrong. To the positive. I thought it was going to go up. The number went down because it was a smart reopening, because we're on top of it, we're studying the data, et cetera. Look at the states that rush to reopen and look at what is happening. Look at our curve versus their curve. It's undeniable. So why are we still having the same political argument? We know that rushed reopenings don't work and the states that rush to reopen are now reclosing. That's another new COVID word, by the way. I don't think there is any such word as reclosing. I'm sure Zach will point out that I used a word that doesn't exist, reclosing. It's a new word in the state of New York. I just proclaim it a new word. They are reclosing. How did that help the economy? It didn't. It set the economy back. You look at where this country is versus other countries on the globe, we're behind the other countries. We got the virus from Europe. Europe now has the virus under control. They're quarantining us because they did a better job. So learn the lessons and let's stop this non-productive political debate that is still going on in this state and in this country. No politics, follow the facts. That's what we did from day one. We do face a threat from the states that rushed the reopening and were not ready. You turn on the news, you listen all day, there's still problems in testing. States don't have tracing operations. States have some counties opening, some counties closing, some counties have this plan, some counties have that plan. They rushed the reopening, they were not ready for the reopening, or they just we're not competent enough to handle the reopening because it was rushed. And we're seeing that increase, it's undeniable, and it is a threat to New York. We now have 39 states with an increasing threat. 
We know that this virus travels. We know that. We know we are not an island in the state of New York. We know that we cannot hermetically seal the state of New York in our own little bubble. So when you see the virus going up in these other states, it poses a threat to New York. Our quarantine enforcement is serious, and I want people coming into this state to know that. States have never done border control before. Uh, we had to scramble. It was another COVID first. But we have police at airports. When you land, there is a police officer there. You have to fill out a form as to where you're going. It is illegal to leave the airport without filling out the form. And then we can follow up from the form. We have some people coming to New York saying, oh, I didn't know that there was a quarantine. I don't know how they did not know there was a quarantine. Uh, there is a quarantine, and we are serious about it. At the same time, we stand ready to help our fellow Americans and the other states. Uh, I have said very clearly, anyone who needs help, anytime, anywhere, we will be there. Uh, why? Because, first of all, it's the right thing to do. I sat here. And I said to the people across this country who watch the briefings, we need help. I said, please help us. New York was in the midst of the crisis. I asked for noc doctors and nurses from across the country to come help us in our emergency rooms. 30,000 people volunteered. I mean, how awesome is that? 30, think about that, 30,000 nurses and doctors who knew the threat. You're a nurse, you're a doctor, you know the threat about working in an emergency room, right? It's not like you're going in blindly. 30,000 people volunteered. I mean, how beautiful, how generous, how courageous. I'll fly to New York and I'll go into your emergency rooms. I said at that time, we will never for forget what people are doing for us. And I said at that time, we will repay your gratitude. New Yorkers mean what they say. And New Yorkers uh, are an honorable people. When we say we will never forget and we'll be there for you, we mean it. I represent New Yorkers. The words came out of my mouth. Uh, I said them on behalf of all New Yorkers. We are going to honor what we said. We will be there for you. And we're working with governments now, uh, Atlanta, Houston, Savannah. We're working with other governments, whatever they need. We understand they're struggling. We understand the pain. We were there and anything we can do. That's the right thing to do. Also, uh, practically, we know that if we don't control the virus in the other states, that we are then in danger of dealing with the second wave. Not the second wave they talked about, which was a mutated virus comes back. It's a second ricochet of the first wave, because we're still in the first wave. But the wave bounced to the west coast and is now bouncing back like a wave in a bathtub. Uh, and that's our quarantine, et cetera. So we understand that we have a, a self-interest in all of this. Uh, and the expression I like to use, a virus anywhere, is a virus everywhere. That's what we should have understood. That's what we should have understood when we first saw the virus in China. Uh, it wasn't China. It was a matter of days before it was here. And by the way, it was a matter of days before it was here. Also. We're monitoring a second threat, which is the rising COVID rates among younger people. Uh, you look at the age brackets, it's basically flat or down except for one group, 21 to 30 years old. And it has ticked up uh, four points. That is a significant increase in a short period of time. And we know why. We have been talking about it. 
You can see it on the news. You can see it in the newspapers. You can see it in social media. It's not hard to understand what is going on. It's hard to deal with it, but it's not hard to understand what's going on. You get groups of young people. It's warm. They've been locked up for a long time. We like to socialize. I get it. You don't socially distance. You don't wear masks. The virus spreads, and it is happening. Uh, to young people, this is not the time to fight for your right to party. I respect your right to party. I fully respect it. Uh, I would enshrine it in the state law if you want to know. You have the right to party. But let's be smart about it, right? There is an attitude that young people are immune. You are not. 21 to 30, the virus can kill you. And if it doesn't kill you, you can bring it home and give it to someone inadvertently, and it can kill them. So they are laboring under false pretenses. And I've had dozens and dozens of conversations, and I've heard the most inane responses. They just don't know the facts. They are dealing with assumptions that are just not true. So first, the local governments have to step up and do the enforcement job. I understand it's not politically popular. I understand it's hard. Uh, some parts of the state, we have uh, health personnel, local health personnel who have gone in, who have been accosted. I understand that. But you have to enforce the law. Just because people don't like the law that you're enforcing doesn't mean you don't enforce the law. Send them with a local policeman. If you need help, we'll uh, get you help with the state police. But we have to enforce the law, and the local governments have to do it. New York City, NYPD, has to enforce the law. Uh, not just the sheriff's office. When New York City wants to enforce the law, you know who enforces it? The NYPD. Enforce the law. State liquor authority and the state police are uh, going to step up their efforts dramatically, but they can't do it without the local police. I've said that from day one. Uh, also, we need to get the facts to the young people who are participating, and they need the facts. And we're going, we're going to start a video ad campaign that is uh, targeted to young people to communicate some of the facts and the misimpressions that they have. Can you run the ad, please? I work out every day. COVID won't kill I'm me. I'm 24. COVID won't kill me. I have antibodies. COVID won't kill me. It's been a long week. COVID won't kill me. I'm 25. COVID won't kill I'm me. I'm partying outside. COVID won't kill me. I don't me. need to wear a mask around my friends. COVID won't kill I'm me. I'm 23. COVID won't kill me. If I haven't gotten it yet, COVID won't kill me. I'm young. COVID won't kill me. Famous last words. Don't let them be yours. Be New York tough and smart. Socially distance. Wear a mask. Mask up, America. That's what you hear when you talk to a lot of young people. There is a total misconception of their vulnerability to this disease. And we hope uh, that that makes uh, a difference. Also, Washington is now discussing a supplemental bill to help with the COVID crisis. There's gridlock and dispute as to whether or not they're going to fund state and local governments to help. Uh, it's very simple. If they want to get this economy back running, you have to fund state and local governments. There is no economic model or research that says the economy is going to bounce back without funding state and local governments. The economic research says the exact opposite. Listen to Chairman Powell. Uh, even the Wall Street Journal says the data shows if you don't fund state and local governments and they have to do dramatic cuts, that's going to hurt the economy. These Republican senators who say, well, they don't want to uh, make the taxpayer pay to bail out uh, blue states. Democratic states, 
Initially, Democratic states are the states that had the most COVID uh, cases. Uh, not true anymore. You now have Republican states that are suffering worse than Democratic states, right? Uh, and this hyper-political Washington attitude, why should a Republican Senate give funds to Democratic states? It's not even true. It is the epitome of hypocrisy. These Republican states have been taking money from the Democratic states for years. For years. You look at who gives and who takes, if you want to get to that basis. New York gives $29 billion. New Jersey gives $18 billion. Massachusetts, Connecticut, California. They all pay more into the federal till than they take out. You know who takes out? The Republican senators who are making this argument. Virginia takes out $82 billion. Maryland takes out $42 billion. Uh, Senator McConnell, Senator Rand, we want to save taxpayers money. You know how you save taxpayers money? Don't take so much money out of the till. You take out $37 billion more than you put in. You want to help taxpayers? Uh, put some of the money back that you have been taking for years. That's how you help taxpayers. Uh, question of federal troops in New York City. The president has sent troops to Portland, Oregon. The president just sent troops to uh, Chicago, Illinois. Uh, the president is talking about sending troops to other cities. The president suggested he would send troops to uh, New York City, troops, uh, federal agents, etc. Uh, I spoke to the president about it. I don't believe there's any justification to send federal troops or federal agents to New York City, and I told him that. Uh, there is no federal property that is endangered that could justify the federal government having to send agents. Uh, the constitutional law is clear on this. The nation does not have a uh, federal police force to deploy in their discretion. Policing is left up to the states. Uh, the president and I had a good conversation. He said he would not be sending troops into New York City. He did not say period uh, ad infinitum, but he said that we would talk uh, before he did anything. Uh, and New York was not included yesterday in the announcement uh, that he was sending troops into Chicago. Um, if the president were to do that, of course, we would sue. I believe it's blatantly unconstitutional. But a lawsuit in this case uh, would also not be highly effective as a short-term measure. There are numerous lawsuits. Portland, Oregon has sued the federal government. Uh, mayors have sued the federal government. The lawsuits take time. And uh, for that lawsuit to work its way through the courts, uh, you'd be talking about a significant amount of time. I think if they sent in federal agents, I think it would be uh, inflammatory. I think it would be pouring gasoline on a fire. And that's the last thing we need, need in New York City. So the president said he heard me. He said he wouldn't do it. He said that we would talk if anything changed. Uh, and uh, it was a good conversation, and I'm going to hold the president to his word, and I have no reason to believe uh, anything other than that. Uh, and the president said if there was a change, uh, we would have a conversation first. But uh, I'll stay on top of this and monitor it, uh, and we'll see where we go from here. But uh, so far, the president has not said anything different than we had on the conversation. In the meantime, New York City must focus on quality of life and essential services. Um, the rationale used in Chicago was crime. We have had uh, a crime increase in New York City. We have to get on that. Uh, the homelessness, the graffiti. Uh, so we have work to do here in New York long term for New York City, we will need a significant effort to restart the economy. And I've said that from day one. 
uh, reimagine the economy, rebuild the economy. You have a lot of people who left New York City when COVID was at its height. Uh, you then have this transformation in the economy where people were home for four or five months working from home and they were introduced to a new way of doing business and you're seeing businesses across the country starting to modify their behavior maybe i don't need to be in the city maybe i don't need all that commercial space maybe i can have half my workforce work from home uh, maybe i can stay in my summer house and work from my summer house and not pay the New York City income tax. So this is a very delicate uh, moment that we're in. You put on top of that uh, the crime increase, put on top of that the scenes of looting that we've seen, put on top of that issues with the homeless, issues with graffiti. It's, it's a bad combination that we're going to have to address. Now, one thing at a time, we have to get through the current crisis, which is dealing with COVID. Uh, but, and we have to make sure there's no second wave, et cetera. But we're going to have work to do to uh, restart and rejuvenate the economy. There's no two ways about that. Uh, one of the best things we've done is the amount of testing that we have done. Uh, you look at these other states that are still having trouble on testing, they're having long turnarounds on testing. Testing is your eyes and ears in this situation. Uh, everything is anecdotal without testing. You have the number of hospitalizations, but that is a lagging indicator, and it's too late when the hospitalizations are going up. The testing was the only facts to tell you where you were today, and you need facts, you need guideposts to plan your strategy. We test more than any state, we test more than most countries. Uh, we've also tested, we do so much testing that we can refine the testing and we can test subgroups. We tested our subgroups of essential workers because I was always worried we made essential workers continue working, did we put them in harm's way? The essential workers were below the level of the overall community. New York City, the overall community is 19.9. Fire department was 17, transit workers 14, healthcare workers 12, NYPD 10. Why is the fire department high? It's fire department and EMT workers. So the EMT workers are really on the spot, right? They're the ones who are showing up. Look at the healthcare workers, 12%. How can the healthcare workers be at 12% when overall in New York City it was 19? How can people working in an emergency room have a lower infection rate? They're dealing with positive people all day long. How can that be? Because these work. These work. That's why, and that's why New York State was the first state in the United States to have a mask order. But we've done more and more testing and uh, we were, did testing in DOCS facility, Department of Correction facilities, okay? I've ta talked enough. Press test. You're the press. This is the test. We tested incarcerated individuals over 55 and over. How many individuals are there in the state prison system who are 55 and over? See, you like to ask questions, but you're not so good on the answering questions. Any guess? Come on. So How many? 10,000. 10, 10,000. 3,900, 55 and over. Why 55 and over? Because COVID affects uh, older people more. What was the percent positive? How many people? Percentage is hard. How many people of the 3,900 tested positive? Three. How many? Three percent. Three percent? Any other bids, I'd offers? Go, go How many people? What's your number? I'd go lower than three. I'd say two or two or one. Two or one. One. <laughs> Seventy-seven positives out of thirty-nine hundred people tested, which is one point nine. So uh, I just want to applaud Commissioner. 
Anucci, and I want to applaud uh, Kelly Cummings. This is a congregate population, uh, 55 and older. They were all asymptomatic, by the way, because symptomatic people had been tested. These were asymptomatic people, the entire population. Uh, so that was a job really well done because, again, these congregate facilities are where we've seen a lot of trouble. Uh, so very good because we are New York tough, smart, united, disciplined, and loving. Questions? Governor, regarding the situation, you said that you, you seem to speak to the president and successfully kind of held him off for doing something drastic like bringing